Well, welcome to worship, everybody. If you're here for the very first time, my name's John, one of the pastors on staff. We hope that you come on back. And before I get started, I just want to remind everyone, too, one more announcement is we have our Tell, uh, tell Me More meetings that are happening right after this service. It'll happen in the chapel. Uh, and uh, remember, the Tell Me More meetings are all about discerning direction for our master plan for our facility, and so we would like to have your input, we'd like to have your voice, and so we want to encourage anybody and everybody to join us this week and next week, and on the Wednesday evenings, the notes are in your handouts, and join us. It's about a 30-minute presentation, and then with some time for discussion after that. It'll be in the chapel right after this service. Child care is available. Take your kids over there, and we'll direct them from that point on. Okay, so we're in the second uh, week of this four-part series called Fear Not, and in this series, we're looking at uh, four different portions of the, the, the birth narrative of our Savior, and in each one of these scenes, an angel appears and says to a different person, fear not, fear not, and today we're in this Matthew chapter 1 where we read about an angel that appeared to Joseph. And today we're going to leverage a little bit of this scene to talk more about uh, Joseph and, and how to overcome our fear of what people think of us. Okay, so I want to start with that question. If I could ask you, how many of you uh, would say that you often care a lot about uh, what people think about you. If, if you could raise your hands, um, do you often care a lot? See, the reason why it's really hard to raise your hand is because what do people think? I mean, if I raise my hand about people caring, uh, and so that's, that's the issue. To some degree, we all kind of care about what other people think. All right, how do you like my hair today? Is it all right? I spent some time on it. I mean, how, how about my outfit? Does this make me look a little fat? I mean, it's one of those, those core questions. And, and the truth is, I'll give you even a greater example than those. Um, how's your Christmas lights doing outside? <laughs> some of you haven't gotten to it yet, right? Starting to get embarrassed because, you know, we put our Christmas lights up a, a, a few days ago, and I was pretty proud of our lights. I mean, um, we, um, we re kind of renovated a big wreath and put it above the garage, and then we found a cool little thing online that looked like a Christmas tree, and we hung that up, and it was so awesome. And then the next day, the neighbors put theirs up. It was like Disneyland. I mean, the inflatables and the music and the lights, and I look at our little kindergarten project, and it was like, oh, no, oh, no, what are we going to do? Maybe I'll hire somebody, you know what I'm saying? But we easily can become obsessed with other people, if we're honest, what other people think about us. And in this week's story, we're going to watch Joseph do battle with the opinions of people and maybe for a, something that is a little more significant than those examples, because he has to decide between doing what is easy and doing what is right, between doing what God wants him to do and doing what other people might want him to do. And so you know the context, right? You, and, and again, this is important because there's going to be a moment in your life where you're going to have to make some of those very same, you're going to have an opportunity to have some of those same decisions. So the context, again, G, Joseph is engaged to be married to a young teenage virgin girl named Mary. In this time in history, though, keep in mind, engagements were a little different than the engagements um, that we have here. I mean, for us, engagements are important, but if something goes sideways in the relationship, we can kind of let it go with no real consequence. But in this time, an engagement was a binding agreement. It actually had some economics tied to it. You would be engaged for a year's period of time, and at that time, if you wanted to break off the engagement, you actually had to file for divorce. Uh, so the only way to get out of an engagement was to file for divorce or die. And if, in fact, if you died, then um, the other person would be considered a widow, a widower. So that's kind of the degree of what we're talking about with an engagement. And so let's pick up the story again at verse 18. This is how, the G, how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we read through this pretty quick, but try to imagine that conversation where Mary sits down with Joseph and says, hey, honey boo, I got something to, I got something to tell you. 
Um, I'm pregnant. But no, no, don't jump to conclusions. I'm pregnant due to the Holy Spirit. To which Joseph would respond, is that what you're calling it now? I mean, the Holy Spirit? Because I saw the guy staring at you at the market, and you got a little something going on on the side, so please don't insult me by saying the Holy Spirit. I mean, if you're Joseph, I mean, what choice do you have? What options does that give you? I mean, from a human perspective, if you factor out the possibility that God actually did this, uh, Mary is either crazy or she's lying. And so Joseph doesn't want to marry Mary, Mary who could be crazy or could be a liar. So at some point, Joseph is going to be asking himself, okay, if I stay with this girl, what's everybody going to say? Everybody's going to know. What are they going to think about us? Now, from Mary, Mary's perspective, she's already marked Right? This was considered a significant sin, punishable by stoning, punishable by death, pregnant out of wedlock. But from Joseph's perspective, he too is marked for the rest of his life. Um, this would cause significant problems whether he divorced Mary and then any kind of future father-in-law wouldn't necessarily automatically give a blessing for his daughter to marry him because of that divorce, because of the significance of divorce, or he might just simply find it hard to do business um, within his spheres of influence because everybody will know what was going on in his life. And, and so we don't know for sure what his state of mind was, but we do know from the text he's thinking about ending the relationship because either he doesn't believe her or he just simply doesn't want to take the heat or the trouble. So he's thinking it's best to move on. Verse 19, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. So he's jumping out of the relationship. Now, most commentaries will tell us that this was, um, seeking a divorce was a very honorable thing to do, which is probably true. I mean, he actually probably really loved her, probably really cared about her, and said, well, maybe she can go have this baby on her own. We can go our separate way and hopefully start over and move on. But Joseph is about to learn one of the most important lessons for those who want to honor God with their life, and that is this, that pleasing God often means disappointing people. That pleasing God often means disappointing people. He's going to learn that if you want to obey God, there's going to be times in your life and in my life when other people will not agree, other people will not understand, other people will look at you, and they will wonder about you. And for Joseph, it unfolds this way. As he considered this, in other words, as he weighed the pros and cons, should I stay with her or not, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, fear not, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now imagine the swing of emotions that Joseph is going through. He probably woke up and said to some effect, wait a minute, could this be real? I mean, for centuries they have been predicting a Messiah was going to show up. Could I be part of history? And at the same time, he would have probably thought to himself, oh, no, 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 this is going to be a problem. I mean, I don't think I can pay the price that this is going to take in order to see this through. I mean, what are people going to be thinking about us? What's this going to cost me? On the one hand, yes, great, I want to I want to change the world. We all want to change the world. I get to be a, maybe a, a, to be a player in changing the world. But on the other hand, I'm going to have everybody telling me, run for your life. You don't want to marry her. You want to get rid of her. And so, should I do what people want or should I do what God want, wants? And I can promise you, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's going to be opportunities in your life where this same dilemma is going to show up in your life. You're going to be confronted with opportunities something easier for the approval of people. And here's the lesson, because becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. The reality is for most of us, when we drift toward wanting to please people, we forget about what God thinks about us, when we're so worried about what other people think about us. We forget that the author of our life 
thinks good things about us, that the author of our life, the creator, the redeemer of our life ha- has, has gone to, to incredible extent to be able to connect with us. We forget that God has a good providential plan for us when we start over-focusing on what other people think about us. Now, the problem is, of course, and you know this, um, you can't please everybody. Even if you, when you drift towards worrying about people so much, you, you can't please everybody. I mean, take your politics, for example. If you want to, um, on a particular issue, go right a little bit on your political um, perspective, because that's where your family is, you're just going to anger the people on your left. And if you decide to go left, same thing, the people on your right are going to be upset. And if you stay in the middle, then everybody's going to be angry with you. So you really can't please people. If once you go in one direction, you're going to displease a different group of people. And you know this. Um, so no matter how hard you and I try, we cannot please everyone. In fact, we tend to get inside of a pleaser trap. Many of us are trapped because we believe we have to be a pleaser. And I think the enemy loves to convince you and me that we don't have a choice, especially not when it comes to obedience to God. So what do you do? How do you guard against the drift toward becoming obsessed with what people think about you, especially because it's the quickest way for your faith to dry up? Well, the good news, the flip side is true as well for all this. Becoming obsessed with what God thinks about you is the quickest way to forget what people think about you. Living for an audience of one, saying, God, more than anybody else, I want to please you. God, more than anything else, I want to be found in the center of your will. God, no matter what, Lord, I want to pursue your priorities because I love you and I want to, I want to live out your priorities. I'm not going to be thinking about everybody else's priorities. Becoming obsessed with what God thinks about you is the quickest way to be released from the trap, the comparison trap of what other people think about you. Now, this might be new news for you, but what is true is that you can please God. I think we've told you too many times that you can't please God. You can please God. And it's not because you make the big monumental decisions in life. Like, should I become a missionary? Or should I pick up my family and move across, you know, the globe? That's not what God's calling you to do. In most circumstances, God is calling you to the small choices. And you can please God in the small choices because God sees what other people don't see in your life. In other words, you get up in the middle of the night again, and God says, I see that you're the one doing this. I see you. Maybe nobody else appreciates it. Or maybe they see the sacrifice that you made for somebody else at work, but nobody else recognizes it. You're not going to see it in your paycheck, but your heavenly Father recognizes it and sees it. Or God, or 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 whatever else it is, that somehow, some way, you make a sacrifice, you become a little more selfless, and someone else benefits, but nobody else recognizes it. But God does. And you know what God says? He says, well done, good and faithful servant, in the small choices. Because I can take those small choices, God says, and I can turn them into something significant, Because you belong to me. You belong to the bigger story. And it begins with the small choices. And so you can please God. You can't please other people at the end of the day. You certainly can't please everyone. But that's the life of a follower. What now, Lord? What now, Lord? Where can I choose to take a risk for you now where other people will benefit but not me? So Joseph is going to have to get to the place in his life where he says, you know what? I value the opinion of God above the opinion of other people. It's true for you and me. You and I, we need to surrender ourselves to living for an audience of one. 
Become obsessed with what God thinks about. It's incredibly freeing from the comparison trap. And, but remember this. Pleasing God often means disappointing other people. As one commentator put it, this was convicting for me. This cut me to my heart. He said, if you're not ready to be criticized for your obedience to God, you're not ready to be used by God. I mean, think about all the different ways Joseph and Mary would be criticized. They'd be publicly disgraced again and again. People would whisper about them. They'd say, yeah, you heard about Joseph and Mary's baby. They'd say it's from the Holy Spirit or something. But, you know, I saw the donkey park there at 2 o'clock in the morning outside of her apartment. Something. I don't know how it plays out for your life. But there's going to be a time when you get a nudge from the Holy Spirit to lead you to do something different that other people are going to look sideways at you about. Maybe you're a student. Maybe you're a high school student, a college student, and you've decided you're not going to keep going on the party scene. And you got to tell all your friends who all they're doing is worrying about partying, and you got to tell them you're done. And they're going to look at you sideways, and they're going to say, what, are you some kind of religious freak now? Or maybe for you, you're in a different season of life. You're in a high-paying job, and you want to you, you want to connect to a different job. It might be lower paying, but you just think your contribution is going to be significant that way. But everybody else is going to be very polite as they look at you sideways and say, but isn't money everything? What are you doing? Or maybe you're, maybe you're going to keep the high paying job, but you've decided that you want to live below your means, not above it. And so that means you, and and you want to do that because you think the way that you're going to make a difference is by having more to give and more to give sacrificially and be more generous. But then you have to bump into the people in your household who's not going to necessarily agree. But you got to think about your... Think about the experiences that have been most significant in your life, and chances are um, it's, it's caused those decisions were first met with resistance and first met with pushback and criticism. Becoming obsessed with what God thinks, you can, God will never lead you astray. It means that you, you take responsibility, you discern, but you prioritize what God wants. Final point, and that is this. Extraordinary acts of God often start with ordinary acts of obedience. So the angel speaks to Joseph and says, Fear not, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what is in her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. You will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. Here's the choice. Does he do what's easy, or does he do what's right? Does he do what people want him to do? Does he do what God wants him to do? Here's what he did. He woke up and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. And through that one simple act of obedience, the greatest act of God in human history was brought to fulfillment. You have no idea what you just might set in motion with one simple act of obedience. So when God speaks to you, wrestle with it, struggle with it, pray over it. What's easy? What's right? What do people think? What will God think? God says to you and me today, I have a providential path for you. I have a destiny-changing path for you. And it starts with one small act of obedience. So fear not. You have no idea what just might hang in the balance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you never grow tired of taking our choices and weaving them into your bigger story, just as you did with Joseph, Lord. Will you help us to fear not 
and help us to be faithful in just a small act today to forgive, to give, to release, to look to you first, to believe, whatever it is. Lord, we're going to make up our minds. We're not going to compare anymore because you've got us on our own journey. And so we're going to serve you an audience of one day by day for the rest of our life. And we look forward to the end of our time when you say, well done, good and faithful servant.